I want to talk about healthy family relationships. Now, we are living in a time and an age when family has really been downtrodden. Family values have been thrown out. People are even having a second thought about really whether family is worth the while. Some are in a changing our mindset of understanding of what family is. And they are coming from the conventional family that we knew where it is a husband and wife, a man and a woman. Now they are telling us that a man and a man can also be family. A woman and a woman can also make family. And so the family institution is at the place where it is under bombardment and a lot of confusion that has come in. So much so that even the people that are now coming into marriage, some of them are not quite well placed as to the values of marriage. And I pray this morning by the grace of God, I'm going to share with us some very basic, very basic and fundamental uh, principles that can help us to have healthy family relationships. For some of us, when we think about family, we think about violence. You know, we have known in families where people are murdering each other. A husband kills the wife or the wife kills the husband or the parent kills the children. We have known of families where there is violence, abuse, physical abuse. You know, GBV, gender-based violence. We are talking about families that are alienated, where people are married and yet they are not married. They don't even know whether to identify themselves as married people or not married. You are in a marriage, but you don't know whether it is a marriage that you can really talk about as being part of. The rate of divorce and separation is escalating by the year. In fact, there was about um, a month ago, there was a, a newspaper ad and the headline sh said that the number of uh, marriage breakups or marriage divorces in Kenya has escalated. I think they were just trying to throw out there some false alarm. But could it be true that out of every three marriages, there is one that either separates or divorces? During the time of COVID, my wife and I, by the way, we are marriage counselors and marriage therapists, uh, coaches, if you would want to say. We, we do a lot of... Uh, you know, marriage counseling. And my wife and I, we sat down with so many people during that period when COVID had come and many marriages were breaking. Because one of the things that happened is that when COVID happened, people had to stay home. And some of them, they don't have any relationship. So they don't know what to do with each other. <laughs> There is this man hanging around, he has nowhere to go to. Or there is this mama now, there is no fellowship that she can run to. There is no orchestra she can go to. She has to stay there with this man and she has to stay with this woman. She has to stay with this woman. Children did have anywhere to go. And many marriages suffered a lot. But one of the other things lately, and my wife would be able to bear witness with me, is the rate at which young families are separating. Some of them even who are our own relatives. People who are barely two years, three years in marriage, five years in marriage, and they are giving up on marriage. And I'm asking myself, what went wrong? What is it that we did not tell them right during the premarital counseling? But young couples are coming and they're saying, I cannot take this anymore. And by the way, the young people have got this other language they normally use and they say, I, 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 I didn't sign up for this. Sign up for it. There is nothing like signing up. You are in a commitment. You are in a marriage covenant. Till death do you apart. It is not a trial and error. But then about two weeks ago, we had a lovely ceremony back in Sitam Gong. We had about 15 couples that were solemnizing their marriages. Can you give a big hand to the Lord for that? <laughs> so what we are saying is that marriage still works. And can work for you. Somebody say amen. amen. And as we think about having healthy family relationships, we are going to see it does not just happen. There must be some intentionality. Somebody must do something about it. You don't just get into a marriage and expect it to be a happy marriage, to be a productive marriage. No, 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 no. It is not an ATM where you put your card and expect money to come out. No, 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 no. 
There is a lot that you need to do, and we are going to see what you and me need to do as we get into our marriage relationships. There is a lot that you must do as a husband. There is a lot that you must do as a wife. There is a lot that you must do as a parent and as a child in a family. And as I talk family now, let me also define family. We are going to see that family now, again, has taken a different uh, dimension. Uh, we are talking about family where we have the conventional husband and wife, father, mother, and children. But also we are going to talk about families where we have single parents, whether the man or the woman is the single parent, that is still a family. We are also going to talk about families where we have had to adopt children and we have brought them into our homes. So that is still a family. We are also going to talk about families that we are now referring to nowadays as blended families, where the husband has his own children, the wife has his own children, and they come and they stay together. And they are now what we call a blended family. So family is family. Whichever dimension you want to look at it, there must be somebody that you relate to as a brother or a sister. There must be somebody that you look up to as your father or your mother. There must be somebody that is relating to you on this dimension of the family. Let's move on. And now we want to look at some things that would help us as we understand and as we appreciate this whole institution of marriage. Let's look at this picture here that I have there. Lovely family there. Don't they look like good? And those are three generations. We have the Gugas there, we have the two parents, and we have the two children. Lovely family. And this is what we hope to have for all of us. But somehow life has taken a different dimension. But let's get back to the word and then look at the principles of how we can have healthy families. I want us to turn our attention to the first Corinthians uh, chapter 13, and we are going to be reading from verse 4 down to verse number 7. First Corinthians uh, chapter 13, if you could go one slide back. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 down to verse number 7. This is what the Word of God says. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And then listen to this, verse number seven. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Shall we pray? Again, Heavenly Lord and Father, we thank you this morning for our gathering here and even for bringing us into this place of worship as family. And whichever family that we represent, Lord, I pray through the ministry of your word that you will help us to sharpen our marriage relationships so that they can be more fruitful and productive so that we can not just be there in surviving but in being able to enjoy each other's company. And I thank you again for every family represented here and I pray that they may be able to be uh, informed and even be equipped on how they can have healthy family relationships. And this we ask with thanksgiving in Jesus' mighty name. And somebody say amen. amen. All right, let's go down now to the real thing. And uh, we want to say in introduction here that a strong family can be a source of emotional support. Uh, particularly in the time that we are living in, there's a lot of mental illness there's a lot of disability in terms of people's mental framework. And you know, you can only be able to survive well if you come from a healthy environment. Some of us come from very toxic you know, environments and that is why we are, we are breaking down. That's why people are committing suicide. That's why people are giving up on life. 
And so it is a source of emotional support, love, security, protection, which makes the challenges and the trials of our day-to-day living easier to face. Whatever challenge that you have, even for those of us who are workers, who are, uh, you know, really laboring and toiling for our families, you can enjoy what you're doing there if you come from a home that supports you and that is encouraging you to do your duty and your responsibility. As you go to school, we shall see, and the psychologists have told us, that the children who are performing well in school are children who come from healthy homes. Again, it has already been documented and been researched, and it has been shown that people who are uh, social misfits and who cause chaos out there come from homes that are malfunctioned. Homes where there is no love, and homes where people have experienced rejection. So children flourish when they feel loved, nurtured, and supported by their parents and their siblings. A good family life can even have positive effects on your physical and mental health. I think I've already mentioned that, including improving your blood pressure and increasing your life expectancy. In other words, your your longevity is able to be sustained because of the background of your family that you come from. Certainly, God wants our families to succeed and to prosper. If you believe that with me, say amen. Amen. All right. He designed the family to be the basic building block of society. And for those of us who want to go even further, we know that the three institutions that God gave to man, number one was the government. And number two was the church. And number three was the family. Or if you want to put it the other way around, the family, the church, and then the government. Thus, in order for our communities to be stable, the families that comprise them must also be well. Can I also say here that a healthy family in the church constitutes a healthy congregation. Well, as if you were. Yeah. And ultimately, God wants us to have spiritually healthy families so that we can produce godly offspring according to Malachi chapter 2 and verse 15 and then expand the godly family that God wants us to have for him. But while family relationships are important, we all know strong families do not just happen. Listen to me. Strong families do not just happen. There has to be an intentionality. You must be deliberate. It must be an act of your own volition to commit yourself to the family and to apply yourself to a family and Play your role and responsibility in order for the sustainability of that family to happen. Sustaining a marriage and raising children are challenging things to do. Later on this afternoon, by the grace of God, we'll be talking about how to raise families in the 21st generation. But I've changed that. And what I'll be looking at basically is the styles of parenting and what the outcome is in the children, whichever generation that you come from. Because you see, the methods change, but the principles are constant. Somebody say amen to that. Yeah. The way our great grandfathers, you know, raised us up, there's nothing that has changed. The principles are the same. It is just the methodology that probably has changed in terms of our approach, particularly looking at what they are calling the Generation Z. (laughs) Those guys are very interesting characters. You know, they were born in the Facebook And they are also raising their lives on social media. Now, we'll be talking about that in the afternoon. So sustaining a marriage and raising children are challenging things to do. If we want to have happy homes, we have to work hard to create them. Somebody say amen. One of the best ways to strengthen your family is by studying the common traits and qualities shared by successful families. In other words, benchmark with other families that have succeeded. 
And I want to bring it out loud and clear. As much as marriages are going down, there are also marriages that are thriving. There are also marriages that are stable and fulfilling. Hallelujah. Amen. And when you understand what a well-functioning family unit looks like, you'll know what changes that you need to make in your own household. Here are some of the most vital characteristics of a healthy family from a biblical perspective. And we want to look at seven characteristics of a healthy family relationship. Number one, can I suggest to us that if we are going to have a healthy family relationship, we must have a deep commitment to one another. You see, people are in families and there is no commitment in that family. They are everywhere doing everything for everybody else and, and, and they are doing nothing for the family. Or can I tease some of us here in the church? There are people who are doing everything in the church, but when you go back home, zero, nothing. Absent mother, absent father. But yet when you come to church, they are all over the place going for missions. They are all over the place leading Bible study groups and doing everything else that is spiritual, but they have neglected their own homes. I want, I want to suggest to us that charity begins where? At home. <laughs> Mission begins with your family. Somebody say amen. amen. Oh yes, it begins right there with your husband and wife and children. Forget about other people there. You must know that your family is well. No wonder even for us as ministers, do you know that my credibility is uh, taken from the fact that if I'm able to take care of my wife and my children, if I'm not able to take care of my wife and my children, then the Bible says I have no business leading the people of, of God. Likewise, even for us, and I want to challenge us as believers, I know people who stay 24-7 in the church and they are absent at home. At mama and wapi, ako kanisani. At daddy ako wapi, he has gone to be with the Lord. Ah, you didn't get it. <laughs> Members of strong families have difficulties, they have discouragements, they have trials, they have troubles just like everybody else. And never think that your marriage and your relationship with your husband or wife or children is a unique thing. I mean, it happens across the board. That's why I like the MCCGs, because in the MCCGs, we are able to compare notes and learn from one another. And you'll discover what you are toiling and uh, hustling about here. There is another one who is even worse than you. I've ever been to the hospital and you're saying, oh, tumbo, tumbo, tumbo. And you sit down there until you see somebody who's looking like as if he's gone. And you want to run home and say, oh, you, do, you just take care of that guy. I think me, I'll take my aspirin and my panado and I'll be good. Their lives can be turbulent. They get laid off and can't find a job. They struggle to make ends meet like every one of us do. Kids and parents at loggerheads with one another don't think it is only your children. What sets them apart is that they don't give up on each other when circumstances become strained or unpleasant. Or when the other party disappoints them or lets them down. Never give up on your marriage. Never give up on your family. Never give up on your husband. Never give up on your wife. Fight for marriage. Somebody say amen. amen. Some of us are quick to throw in the towel. And then you come and see me and tell me, Pastor, because of unreconcilable reasons. Unreconcilable reasons? Two years in marriage? Huh? You haven't even finished the honeymoon hang-ups. What are you divorcing about? What are you separating about? Deep commitment to one another. They have a steady and unwavering dedication to each other. A commitment to stay together. Till death do us apart in good times and in bad times. In good health and in bad health. When money is there and money is not there. When children are not coming and children are coming. Some of you know what I'm talking about there. So number one is that we must be committed to this institution called family. We must be willing to die for it. 
My goodness me, the way some of you are so committed to your place of work, you are very careful about the time, you are very careful about the deadlines. Now, have the same tenacity and commitment for your family. Be ready to sacrifice everything else for you to be with your, with your wife or with your husband or with your children. That is the commitment that helps in building towards good family relationships. Somebody say amen. Number two, we must move very quickly. I said there are seven. Family time is top priority. That is another thing that we need to work on. Between long work weeks and school activities and household chores, family time can be brought to the place where it is relegated to the back. Still, healthy families always find time. Can I put it in another way? Create time. Because sometimes finding time is not easy. You must do it. You must create the time to be together no matter how busy you are. You cannot be too busy for your wife. You cannot be too busy for your husband. You cannot be too busy for your children. I know parents who never go to any school for any children's program. I remember in one occasion we were having this, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? The Hopes Camp. And there was this boy, my goodness me, very talented boy who was doing everything. And he, I mean, that guy is just so talented. And so on the day when they had asked me as a senior pastor to come and graduate these boys and girls, they normally do that at the end of the year. You know, they had such a lovely display and everything was just wow. And you know, there were parents who had come. Normally the last day, they invite the parents to come and just crown this time that we have with our children at the, uh, what do you call it? The Hopes Camp. And I noted there was this boy who, in spite of winning everything and shining, the father and the mother was not there. The guy was all alone. So I decided to do what? <laughs> to go and stand in for him. When people were taking pictures and you know, celebrating with their children, I, mean, I decided to do that for him. And later on, I got to know his story. He was telling me, you know, <laughs> me, I don't know whether I belong to dad or mom. You know, I come from a situation where sometimes when I close school, I don't know whether to go to Kitale where my mom is or to Nairobi where my father is. The kind of pressure that we put on our children. I normally tell parents, please, if you have your beef, have your beef between yourself, but never bring your children in the midst of your beef. Children are innocent. They just know daddy and mommy, period. Don't talk bad things about daddy to your son or to your daughter so that you can win them to yourself. That's one mistake that we make. If we are going to have healthy family relationships, we must have time for one another. We must create time for one another. I also want to challenge even the young people. You guys are all over the place with your peers and your forgotten home. You are flying everywhere else with everybody else, but daddy and mommy, those guys are uh, ancient. They're dinosaurs. We don't want to hang around them. Watcha you. You need family. You need family. One of these days when you're in trouble, you'll discover you'll stand all alone and the person who will be looking out for you, who will have sleepless nights is your mom and your dad. Still, Healthy families find time to be together in spite of our busy schedules, in spite of our traveling up and down, in spite of the many things that we do, we know that time together is very crucial. When we spend quality time together as a family, we express our actions that we value and care about each other. This makes the family members feel more connected to each other and it helps build and strengthen family bonds. Somebody say amen. Family time could include things like shared activities, like eating out or eating together at home, playing games together, going on picnics, watching sporting events together, enjoying recreational activities together. I normally say there are four Ps about family life. The family that prays together stays together. The family that plays together stays together. The family that plows together stays together. The family that plans together stays together. Be committed to the family. 
do everything else, but remember that it's family. There was one time this uh, leadership guru, jo Dr. John Maxwell, apparently he, he, he goes all over the world. He meets with the internationals and you know, the presidents and everybody else. So he had been invited to go to the United Nations in New York assembly to talk to the people that were there. And uh, incidentally, when he got there and he was preparing to go and talk to this assembly, you know, United Nations Assembly, people have come from all over the world. You know, it's a high level kind of meeting, high profile kind of meeting. And uh, incidentally, that morning, as he was about to go and, um, you know, speak to those people, he got a call from his son who was about, I don't know, 2,000 kilometers away uh, from their home. I don't know. I can't remember the specifics. But he says the son called him, and he was crying on the phone profusely, and he, was, he could not just hold himself as the father listened to him narrate how he had just broken relationship with his girlfriend. And uh, so this put the man of God under a lot of pressure. And he goes on to say this. He talked to the guys of this big meeting at the UN and told them, you know what? I'm uh, absconding coming to my speech because I have an urgent matter to deal with my family back home. And he got on to the next flight to his home to be with his son who was down. <sighs> I don't know how many millions he would have got just by speaking to that congregation. But millions could not equate to the comfort and the solace of his son. Healthy families also work at developing constructive communication skills. This includes learning to be open and honest, but still speaking the truth in love, listening carefully, without distractions, not having a mind-reading kind of mindset, or jumping to false conclusions when another person is speaking. Give the other person time to speak. That's what communication is all about. Just the way you want to be heard, let the other person also be heard. It's a two-way traffic. There is the listening, and there is the talking. And one person can only talk at one time. And the beauty about talking is that sometimes we are able to hear things that we would have otherwise missed hearing from one another. I would even want to uh, make it a little bit more involving that these conversations to, should not be on telephone, should not be on WhatsApp. If, if they can be physical, you know, one of the things me I didn't like about this thing called COVID, it brought alienation. Imagine that you cannot come even to church <laughs> because of COVID. That you cannot have Bible study. You cannot have, everything was all online, online. And some people are saying the new normal. I said, there is no new normal. It's going to go away, this thing. Because God did not create us that way. We were not created to be people who are remote controlled. We are people who are social beings. And we relate better when we are interfacing with one another. And as a family, when you have opportunity to talk and listen to each other face to face, you are able to see physically, or rather visually, what you may not hear in terms of the physical. And that's why constructive communication is very necessary. Number four, the other ingredient that we need for us to have healthy families, my time is really going, is sincere appreciation is frequently expressed. To be a truly successful family, it is vital not only to feel appreciated, but also to do what? To express it. Every one of us wants to be appreciated. No one ever wants to be told you are good for nothing. Whoever says, nobody wants to hear that. Nobody ever thrives on that. And you know, when, if that is the only conversation that goes on in the home, my friend, you are doing a lot of injustice to your family. We are even going to see when the child brings you a report from, and they are number 10 out of 20. Hmm? As parents, we have come with this uh, stereotype. You know?
to be number one. Number one gani na wewe kwanza ulikuwa tail huko chumba. Hmm? Just be yourself. There's no need to pretend to your son. After all, do you know you pass on your very own DNA to those, uh, those guys? <laughs> oh my goodness me. Hiyo ni DNA yako. Wacha madharao mzazi. Appreciate that young man or that young girl. When she brings you number 10, tell her, you know, my dear, you can become number five next time. You encourage her. You encourage him. And because of that moral support from you, you will find the person just continues to thrive. But the moment you show him like you have come number two, bono kukua number one, you're already showing him that you do not appreciate the effort that the child has made. Appreciation helps motivate family members to continue to behave in a positive way towards each other. It also helps build confidence within a person so that we uh, so that we have what it takes to meet the obstacles that are inevitably going to come our way in life. Appreciation also should be expressed frequently, both verbally and with meaningful gestures. This might be done by telling your spouse how much you have enjoyed the dinner that he or she prepared, or just by saying thank you, you know, just saying thank you. Sometimes just people just feel elated by the fact that somebody just said what? Thank you. To your children, even after they have cleaned up the kitchen. These are some sentiments to be expressed by, you know, sometimes just a loving note to your good person, you know, or making some things that just makes the other person feel uh, loved and, you know, they feel valued. Even just like a text like this, it just surprise them. You know, some of these things, they may look small, but they build up to a bigger family healthy situation. But appreciation should not be limited also just to thanking others and what they have done for you. Family members can also know how else they can be able to do this. And sometimes tell your spouse and children what qualities that you admire about them. Affirm them. You know, praise their strengths and accomplishments. Like as I said earlier on, don't always look at the negative. Some of us are so negatively bound that all we see is the negative things. You know, just like some of the places where, uh, you know, some of us work, eh, is until you make one mistake, everything has come tumbling down on you. It's like you never did any good thing. <laughs> you know, that is how some of us treat one another in our marriages. And you'll be very surprised. Sometimes my wife and I, as we're doing our marriage, uh, you know, coaching and we helping couples, we normally ask them, okay, so you don't like this guy. And yes, you don't like this lady. Yes. But okay, let's put aside what you do not like. But at least write down some things that you like about them. And you'll be very surprised, these same guys who have come to the office there saying they do not like each other, they have so many positive things that they know about each other. You see, that is how life sometimes treats us. They only want to show the bad side of us. They don't want to show the good side of us. And the devil likes that, you know, because the devil, by the way, is the accuser of brethren. So if you can find fault in your wife, he anakuchotea, anakuambia, hata ile ingine, ile ingine, yes. Na wife na anakubuka, hata ile vile ulifanya during the wedding reception. Hiyo hata hiyo pia hapo. Hasa na shindwa. 20 years in marriage and wedding reception ilifanyika lini hivyo. Ha! Let them know that you enjoy spending time with them. Done sincerely, expressions of love and appreciation deepen the bond between family members and strengthen the family unit. Number five, very quickly. Family members look out for each other. They cover each other's back. The worst that you can ever do is to go and talk bad things about your husband out there. Is to go and talk about bad things about your wife, Uko. Ama munakana wale your family members who are her in-laws or who are his in-laws. And you, you, you go mounting as they are talking about how, you know, this woman is like this. And you are saying, yes, in fact, the other day also, she, she did. No, no, no. How? 
That is shooting yourself in the leg now. If there is any PR person for the family, it is you. Always talk good about your husband. Somebody say amen. Always talk good about your wife. Talk good about your children. Family members look out for each other. They cover each other's backs. Jesus Christ taught his followers and says, whatever you want men to do for you, do also for them. Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 12. Healthy families do their best to live by this golden rule. Don't do to others what you do not want them to do for you. Don't talk about others the way you don't want them to talk about you. In fact, that is one rule that I've applied in my life. It has helped me so much. I would never want to do anything to somebody else that I would not want them to do for me. Individuals in their family consider how others will be affected when making important decisions. Don't make a decision and then come and expect us to come and do what? Rubber stamp it. No, 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 no. Call a family kamkunji. And talk about some of these things. Call mama and tell her, let's go for a cup of tea because there is this project I have. You know, not just surprising people with things. And sometimes the things that you're surprising them with, they're wondering, so where, where, where is my voice in this? You know, there was one couple that I was dealing with in uh, marriage counseling. And oh my, they, they, they had said, this is it. We are going to split because of this. Because the man had just discovered that the wife, when she went in to get their, uh, their child, their, their, it was, I think, their second born or something like that, she decided to do tubal litigation. You know what TL is? In Misema, you ni forever. Hakuna kupata watoto. And they had not discussed it. So one time, as they were talking about family and what, nasitupata kakengine katatu. It's no entry. Now, if you want to destroy your marriage, sometimes make some of those kind of very heavy decisions by yourself. Or you invest in something you never discussed with your husband or wife about. Sometimes I normally ask even people, why do we withhold information from one another. Inakuwa mchezo ya paka na panya concerning our, our, our property, concerning our bank, uh, you know, activities or information. And sometimes I normally ask, wewe uki disappear, nani atashugulika na yu maneno? Some people have to go look for letters of administration because you never even thought about them inheriting what you have. Or rather, it goes back to the public Trustee, and they're the ones who run your big millions that you left behind. Because you never bequeathed them to your children. I normally ask people again, why is the next of kin your brother and your sister and your married man? Why isn't your husband the next of kin? Why isn't your wife the next of, of kin? Of, yeah. Who should take care of your property when you're gone? Is it not your husband now? Or your wife? So why are you saying uh, Shosho to be the next of kin now? And then there are these young couples who are now getting married recently. Who have also decided, me, I'm going to maintain my name. So they get married and they don't want to inherit the name of their husband. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for me, when I got married to this lovely lady here, by the next week we had already gone and changed everything. Her IDs read my name. Every one of our certificates now read my name. <laughs> the properties that we own, we own together, my dear. I don't want to expose things here. I don't know what they are worth. I don't know what I'm worth, but I can tell you. <laughs> she knows what I'm worth. Hakuna kitu ni mefitia. Hakuna secret bank account. Kila kitu kwa wazi. 
She knows when I have the money and when I don't have the money. And the other thing also we do is there is nothing like her money and my money. And some ladies, I don't know which uh, person told you this. It is not in the scripture. That his money is our money and my money is? Where you, what are you? You are going to go to the Bible. At yet, when you know, William Bio, at now, the man is the head and you are the, the, the neck. What up, you will summon your work. Nina Soma Kuna Bavu, as she says, Soma Kitu at the Kama, at the Kitu Hapapana. The, the ladies who do that are with the Jezebel spirit, the spirit of intimidation and domination. And so, what am I saying, people of, of Eldoret? Talk to each other, have conversations about these things, plan together, dream together. It should not just be surprises. Look out for each other. Before speaking, think about whether they would want to be on the receiving end of what you are about to say. Sometimes this means sacrificing personal desires in order to encourage or support one another. A husband must forego what he would have wanted to do during his day off to make time to be with the kids. The wife also must probably, uh, you know, go wherever the husband wants to go with her, even though that is not her idea of fun time. Sometimes we do certain things, not because we like doing them, but just because of the family sake. Somebody say amen to that. Lastly, putting the welfare of others above our own is the essence of Philippians 2, 3, and 4, where Paul admonished us to esteem others better than ourselves and not to just seek our own personal interest. Number six, we are almost getting there now. Conflicts are resolved constructively and promptly. I'm told last week you had somebody come and talk to us about conflict resolution. While you may not mean to, there, are, there may be times when you offend those closest to you or hurt their feelings. And let me put a ride on this. I'd say that the place that we are mostly vulnerable and mostly hurt is family. You know, people can call you names, they can push and pull you all over the place, and somehow you'll survive. But what uh, your wife does it or your husband, it comes with a different depth of feeling. The place where we are most hurt is not out there, is usually from within the family. Misunderstandings are no more part of family. Please, don't find your marriage to be unique. I normally tell couples when I'm talking to them that, you know, this man that you're wedding or this woman that you're wedding is not a perfect man. So if not a perfect man, it means there is a, there is a window, there is a possibility that he can fail, that he can change, that he can, you know, maybe not keep up to his promises. It's not that he wants to do that. It's just that he's a human being and he's limited. It's only God who is the perfect God and who keeps to his word, who there is no shadow of turning with. But my friend, if you're still in a marriage where you are relating with a human being, know that a human being is bound to err, is bound to fail you. And that's why sometimes some of us get so deeply hurt because when you have stayed with this person for 5, 10 years, 15, 20 it's not easy. But if the parties do not make amends with each other, they can lead to bitterness, grudges on both sides. And this morning, by the grace of God, I would like to just pray for families that need healing and forgiveness. That need healing and forgiveness. Some of us are not able to play our roles as we need to because there is a grudge, there is a deep seated bitterness or anger <clears throat> against your beloved. And I pray this after this morning God is going to bring healing out to us. Somebody say amen. Pastor, I see my time is up. Can I take some two, 10 minutes, kindly? All right, I'm just about to do number seven, and then we'll close. But I want to pray for families here. 
because I know there are many people who are in family, as I said, and they don't know quite whether to identify with the family or they are outside of family. You know, there are people who are contemplating leaving and taking off. There are people who are feeling like they have gone into the wrong place with the wrong person. But I believe like Jesus, or rather God would tell, G would tell uh, Paul, you know, my grace is sufficient for you. You still have to belong to that family. That thorn in the flesh may not come out. But God will give you the grace to sustain you. Somebody say amen. Communication and respect then start to wane. And mistrust builds and family connectivity disappears. When offenses occur in healthy families, bad feelings are not allowed to fester. Conflicts are resolved quickly. Address issues. The offender must be willing to apologize and take responsibility for his or her mistakes. Let us leave this pride, you know, thing. You know, let us avoid this thing of, you know, she must be the one to come first. No, no, no. Sometimes you have to humble yourself and be the one to go because you value your marriage. The offended person listens carefully to the perspectives of the family member with whom she or he is at odds and is quickly able to forgive also. They talk things out without attacking each other personally in terms of personal vendetta. Instead of addressing the issues, they start addressing each other or undressing each other, if I may say that. The worst is when you go to court and you have to talk very negative things about one another. And sometimes you even bring your children to listen to what you're talking to each other about. If parents have wronged their children, they should take the lead in repairing the relationship. Sometimes we fail our children. You know, we didn't act well. We didn't speak well. We didn't relate with them well. Take the privilege and the opportunity to be the one to move in and reconcile with your son and with your daughter. I remember there was one wedding I was going to conduct at Sitam Valley Road. And incidentally, this girl who was getting married, the mother and the father had separated so very bitterly and they had even gone ahead and divorced. Now, on this material day, <coughs> when we are supposed to be having the wedding, the parents decided that is the day they are going to come and settle their score. So this guy, I remember he comes from one of those places and he came with some big fellows, you know, people of substance. Waze <laughs> Wamekuja to state their position. And their position was, who you is getting married, how did she get married without my knowledge? Who was paid the dowry in the first place? And this is my daughter. So I can let your beef up. I have no mama I didn't know she can talk 2,000 words at a go. So I told them, let's go to the boardroom. So them say with his, was this, who had come with him, they sat on one side of the boardroom table, and the mama with her people also, she sat on this side. And each one of them had a point to make, had a score to make. But you know, I looked at them, and I told them, who is getting married? It is your, it is your daughter. It is not you. So please, this thing of yours, leave it outside. Let us do what? Encourage our daughter to get married properly. And apparently the daughter was getting married to one of our elders in the church. So the son to one of our elders. So what we decided, Pastor Kiprop, was to have none of them participate. Because the question was, who will walk the girl down the aisle? So I told them, no, no. Iyo mambo ya dawa, iyo mtazunguza na wazea huko inche. Na tena hii mambo ingine ya kutembe hapa. What we shall do is this. None of you is going to walk down this girl. So I asked her, do you have a brother? He said, yes. I want that young to be called. They called the young man. So I told him, Matt, you are the one who's going to walk down your sister to the, to the altar. 
And that is when the wedding took place. Otherwise, that was the day of war. Kila mtu alikuwa amesema sasa nitamuonyesha nani ndio nani. What am I saying? Where, where did I go there? I said, you know, conflicts need to be resolved constructively and promptly. The Bible says, love does not keep record of wrongs. Even some of these things that we say that are unre- unreconcilable. I believe in the economy of God. There is always room for reconciliation. There is always room for restoration, there is always room for forgiveness. And that includes the willingness to apologize as a parent, do what you need to do to your son and to your daughter. Number seven, and lastly, as I conclude, because we must go into prayer. And that is shared spiritual commitment. Families that are strong are bound to be in unity by their shared relationship with God. When individual family members learn to love God, respect his laws and biblical instructions, they become closer and closer to one another. The more we are backslidden from God, the more alienated we become to each other also. But did you know that? We don't just get alienated from God as we remove ourselves far from God. There's usually a triangle like this. You know, the man, the woman. And the man and the woman can come closer as God brings them closer. Yeah. They can only become farther from one another as they go farther from each other. Being committed to God's way of life give healthy families a sense of purpose and adds meaning to their lives. They have a reason to work at their relationships and are more likely to stay together. They are able to put trials and difficulties into perspective and maintain the right focus. God's word provides guidelines for living which will help families create positive home life. To truly be a spiritually committed family, parents must set the pace, reflect their commitment to God in their personal lives. In fact, I would want to add here that if you do not have a family altar in your home, it is high time today, by the grace of God, that you establish what? A family altar. A time when you pray and read the word of God together as a family. If your younger kids see you studying your Bible, serving others, and obeying God's commands, if you talk about God as you go through your day-to-day activities together, they will know that God is a top priority in your life. As they see that positive example on a daily basis, it will encourage the entire family to have that same spiritual commitment. Concluding. What are we saying? While each of these qualities of strong, healthy families is vital in and of itself, they all overlap, interact, and reinforce each other, almost like the Ten Commandments. For example, if you spend a lot of time with your family, that enhances communication process, which facilitates people to express their appreciation of one another. When you are committed to making a relationship work, you will see the need to forgive and to resolve conflicts. If your family falls short in any of these areas, don't despair. There is hope. Somebody say amen. No human being will be a perfect parent or a perfect spouse or a perfect son or perfect daughter or a perfect sibling. There is nothing like perfect people. What matters most is that you are striving to have a good family relationship. Understanding the traits of healthy family is the first step towards the bigger things that God wants you to have 